Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Dave Corr, and I think uh, I know most people uh, who are on here. Hope everybody's doing well and staying safe and uh, staying busy and hasn't spent too much time on, on the Zoom, although I kind of like it. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our lead presenters today, Dan Shulman of ESPN and Jay Billis of, what's the law firm, Jay? Got to give him a plug. Yeah, more than Vanilla. Thank you. Hey, Andy, Moonlight's doing other stuff. I, I forget what, but thank you guys for uh, participating today. And why don't we start off with um, just some of the things. Last week we had a play-by-play -play prep uh, discussion. Maybe if you guys would talk about how you have a game coming up, say, on a Monday night and how you start getting ready for it and the communication you have between you and your crew. Yeah, you want to go ahead? Go. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, I, I, from my role, I kind of feel like I'm preparing all the time for games. So it's not like I have some sort of start and stop date for a, for a ball game that I do. But basically what I try to do is put together a scouting report for each team uh, that we're covering in that particular game. And so in putting that scouting report together, uh, I, I watch film of each team, and uh, so I have I have player tendencies that I put together, and then team tendencies, what each team does, and then I'll go back and you know I'll look at what they've done lately, especially, and that includes talking to some of the coaches they've just played, um, because oftentimes I can glean more from an opponent's um, opinion of a team than I can from the, you know the coach of that team. Uh, the, the opponents are more likely to tell you about perceived weaknesses and, and strengths, things like that. And, and usually, and I think it's the same for both Dan and me, that we try to get uh, into the location uh, the day before the game to see practice. It's a little bit different now than it was maybe 10 years ago or so. I don't know I, the exact date, but I'm just picking 10. Um, it's a little bit harder now because – uh, teams uh, charter, uh, you know, the teams we're doing, they charter. So if you get in the day before, you're only going to see the home team. You're not going to see the, the away team. Uh, you'll really only get to see them at a shoot around. Uh, so I think you have to take a little bit more time uh, and make sure you've got your ducks in a row on the, uh, on the, the, the away team uh, that's traveling. They usually travel in, you know, night before they'll practice at home, travel in night before, and you'll, you'll see them at the shoot around if you're fortunate. Um, but I, I put together my, my game charts. Um, I handwrite them. I've used the same format for a while. I change the format every once in a while just to, you know, mix it up for my little pea brain. And then uh, I rarely look at it during the course of a game. I have it with me on the desk, but I usually only look at it during a break, uh, maybe a little bit at halftime uh, or if I need a, a particular stat. Uh, but I do keep them all with me. And there have been occasions in the past where I see something and it reminds me of something from another game and, uh, and I'll look back at it, but it's pretty rare that I look down at, at something uh, that I have on the scouting report, unless there's something specific that the, the game itself has drawn me to. And, and that's intentional over the years. Um, I try to do all my preparation so that I can just react to what I see on the floor and what Dan and I may be talking about. Uh, so it, 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 there's a, a level of freedom that comes from uh, the preparation where you can just react instead of, instead of you know, treating your board as some sort of script, if you will. And I think we're all probably the same in that we, we might get 10% of what we've prepared into a broadcast. You just don't know what 10% it's going to be in any given game. Uh, yeah, I would, I would echo everything that Jay just said. It's, you know, one of the questions I get asked, Dave, is how many hours a day do you work? And there's no answer to, to that question um, because it varies from day to day. And, and for example, if Jay and I were to have a Louisville game in February, but we didn't have them in November, December, January, and I think I can speak for Jay on this, it's not like we're not paying attention to them at all. We have a general idea of the 30, 40, 50 schools we might see over the course of a season. And, you know, during any given week, even if Louisville's not on my schedule, if they're playing Notre Dame, I'm, I might watch that game because I'll have them down the road or I'll be at the ACC tournament or, 
or something like that. And I definitely try to watch the two most recent games of each team that we're doing. And if the two teams that we're doing have already played earlier that season, whether we did the game or not, I will definitely watch that game uh, to see if there's anything in there. There's always something interesting that comes out of that. Uh, and like Jay, I handwrite everything. Jay is being modest. Um, his notes are really good. They're uh, color coded and they're legible. Uh, uh, my notes look like a third grader did it. And, and I might be insulting third graders when I say that. Um, but whenever I talk to younger, like broadcasting classes, whatever works for you, it doesn't have to be fancy because believe me, mine, mine aren't fancy. But the same as Jay, I think the act of handwriting it makes it stick in my brain. And just like Jay said, when we do a game, like if you came to us one minute before a game and said, we're taking all your notes away, I think we'd be okay with that. Because like Jay said, we feel we've done the work we have to do before the ball goes up in the air. And when the ball goes up in the air, we just want to watch the game and talk. Uh, we don't want to be looking down and reading and scrambling for papers and things like that. So I, I, I think it, it's, it's kind of on a daily basis from, you know, October all the way through the season you know, through practice and all the way through the season, just, you know, you know, having your work habits in order, staying on top of things as best you can. You can't always do that. Every now and again, you'll get a game on your schedule that wasn't there a week ago and you haven't seen these teams. And like I know at the beginning of the year, when we go to Maui, we see eight schools. Now this is mid to late November. We see eight schools and we probably haven't seen any of them, maybe one of them before we got there. So that's when you make good use of the, of the time on the plane, getting out there and, and, getting as much up on things as you can. And that's when going to practice is really valuable. Like when we go to a Duke or a Carolina practice in February, we've seen those teams four or five, six times already. Uh, out in Maui, believe it or not, we're not lying on the beach. We're in the gym going to practice and, and talking to eight coaches and getting to know those eight rosters because especially with the freshmen too, we haven't seen them in person yet. And there's so much turnover from year to year. You really want to make sure you know who everybody is. Great. Um, when you guys first met, I mean, obviously, when you work together as a play-by-play -play color team, there has to be some kind of a relationship. Talk a little bit, if you would, about how um, that has developed from the time you guys first met and, and maybe even, even nonverbal communication during a game and how you guys handle that. I, I wish I remember the first game we did together. I have no idea. It would be in 1996, 7, somewhere around there, Jay. Does that sound right? I think it was Maui, Dan. I was your sideline reporter. Way back when, back in the 90s? I think so. I, yeah. think, I think that that was really wow. the first time when I was doing sideline. And because um, uh, I did that for a number of years in addition to uh, sort of analyst work. And then we would work together from time to time uh, throughout that period. Um, but, you know, we've always, Dan is, is and he, he will always be modest about this, but on the scale of easy to work with, Dan is is at the top of that that scale. Um, he, he's he's got an extraordinary ability to have command of of the broadcast in a, in the best possible way, but at the same time, he's always thinking about well, are you getting in enough? What can I do to help you? And so uh, he, he's in, in a way. Uh, I think he and Reese Davis, uh, in my you know my view. Uh, are, are sort of the two best at um, making sure that their colleagues are taken care of and they get what they need in. Uh, and then at the, but at the same time, you know, number one is the broadcast and, and taking care of what needs to be done uh, for, the, for the betterment of the broadcast. So, uh, and that was evident from, from day one. So there's, there's always been uh, an ease to working with Dan that I don't think is unique to me. I think, I think everybody that's worked with him will say, man, easiest, easiest to work with in the business. Well, I appreciate that. I think, and Dave, I don't know if somebody told me this or if I stumbled onto it on my own, but I, I kind of think of what we do. We're a team sport as well. There's me, there's Jay, there's whoever our reporter is. There's the producer, the director, the statistician, the tape people, the camera people. Um, and I kind of think of my position as being the point guard. Like, I start with the ball, but I got to move the ball around, get the ball to Jay, get the ball to Holly, get the ball to the tape people, the graphics people, back to studio, whatever the, the case may be. Um, you mentioned uh, unspoken, you know, even during a game. It, it just kind of, I mean, we've done, I don't know, literally hundreds of games, hundreds and hundreds of games together by now. So, you know, I know the areas Jay is 
is most passionate about. Again, we've been together at dinner the night before a lot. We've been together at practice. We've not that we sit there. It's never really a meeting. It just kind of is the conversation that we're having over the course of a couple of days leading up to the game. So I know kind of what's at the top of his mind, and I'm sure he would know the same about me. He knows my tendencies. I know his tendencies. Um, and it, it becomes second nature. I imagine it's like a shortstop and a second baseman who have played together for years and years. You know, the shortstop knows where the second baseman likes to feed on the pivot for the double play. And, and you just try to get it to him in the right place. So, you know, we've both been in situations where we've worked with people we haven't worked with before. Uh, I worked with John Crispin a couple of times this year, and I had never met John Crispin until breakfast the day of the game and got to know him there. And then we went to the two shoot arounds and then we did a game. But again, to use a baseball analogy, it's like a pitcher being acquired in a deal and he comes into the game and the catcher walks out and says, nice to meet you. What do you throw? And, you know, so there's, there's some unfamiliarity, but I, I think, um, you know, if you go into it with a real good team attitude, which Jay has a tremendous amount of as well, he's always working with the director and the producer on what replays to show. Can I draw this? Can we do that? If you go into it with a team attitude, I, I, I think it becomes second nature pretty quickly. And you guys, you guys have become friends, obviously. Um, how important is that? Well, Jay doesn't like my coffee order because it's too many words. So <laughs> <laughs> this is this is and the and biggest is issue that? in my relationship. What, what uh, is his that? coffee order is two words, and he can shrink it to one. Mine is four, <laughs> and those extra two words just piss him off like you can't believe. <laughs> you, what are they? I want to know what they are. Order? Can you remember my coffee order? Uh, non-fat vanilla latte, something yeah, like yes. that. R Gran that's right. right. Grande. <laughs> right. That's the one time he bought me a coffee. He remembers the order. It's a, a, uh, if it's, over, Grande two, if it's over two words, it's not coffee anymore. Then it becomes right. some sort of meal order. Right. And, so, uh, so we'll go into a Starbucks on the way back from practice or whatever, and he'll say, you know, give me a man's coffee or something like that. And, 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 I'll, and I'll say grande, not fat vanilla latte. And then he'll apologize to the person at Starbucks for me having so many words in my coffee order. Other than that, we get along pretty well. <laughs> Jay, how well, to, answer, to answer your question, Dave, I, I think it is important. And I, I don't know if Jay's had this. I, I've been fortunate. I would say 99% of the people that I've worked with you get along with, you know, some you're great friends, some you're good friends, some you're friendly, but you get along with. It's very, very rare, I think, in my experience, and I've been fortunate that I, that I don't get along with somebody. But it, it's tough if you don't get along with somebody. And, and, and again, not only is it nice to be friends, if you have the same goals about the broadcast, then, then I think that, that really helps as well. Like, I, I don't ever feel that Jay and I are competing for, I want to say this, no, I got the information, so I, said, I should say it. Like, that has never happened between us ever and i think that's really important as well yeah and one of the things i think um you know dan and i are, are really good friends and uh, i've never really worked with anybody that i didn't find you know pleasant to work with where i had a problem with anyone i've been very lucky in that regard um but when you've got people like dan that are are so much fun to be around uh, that you kind of, it's not just the game. You look forward to the entire experience of, of being, you know, being there. Um, you know, it, it, when you get in, hey, you want to grab something to eat or dinner or whatever, um, everything's easy. It's just it, to, to be able to do games, to work with your friends is, is an added bonus, I think, and really cool. And I think we're pretty fortunate that we realize um, – that what we're doing is uh, is a privilege, and it's what we've always wanted to do. And and our jobs like are so much fun. Like all of our friends are, are that are not in broadcasting or not in sports. There's an envy they have that you get to do. You get to go to that game and get paid for it and stuff. So um, I think we do a pretty good job of keeping that in mind and not taking how special the job is for granted. Uh, and that, that's helpful too, that, that, um, and part, you know, part of it is we're older and maybe a little bit more secure that we're not going to get, you know, kicked out the next day if we make a mistake. Um, so we're, uh, we're a little more open to, Hey, what do we need to do to make this the best? I mean, and, and Dan's point about, we're not competing for anything. 
our only competitive instinct is what do we need to do to, to make this better? And how can, how can we help our colleagues? And, you know, we want to be, be as professional and prepared as we can be, but, but nobody needs to make the, and, and Dan and I talked about, I probably rambled here, but Dan and I talked about this fair amount. Like I always feel like in my role as an analyst, if we have a great game and they replay uh, some of our stuff, uh, some of our game on sports center, I should never hear my voice. It should be all Dan. Um, there's never a time that that if there's a highlight of some great play, like Sports Center's not putting analysis on. They're they're putting on the play, and that's what Dan does. And as long as I don't get in, in the way of that, um, I, I've probably done a pretty decent job. I'm good with that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other thing too is, and we should mention them by name. You know, we talked about some of the other people. We are we work with the as good a producer as you'll ever find and as good a director as you'll ever find. Jeff Dufine and Doug Holmes. They probably do 80 to 90 percent. We work with other great people as well. Eric Mosley, who's also fantastic, produces a lot of our early season uh, games. And then we're with we're with Jeff through conference play and into the ACC tournament. Uh, those are the real stars of the show. Like those are the guys who could make who can clean up our mistakes sometimes before we make them. And, and they're the people who communicate beautifully if with everybody. A, uh... like, you know, like we're in our headsets during a game, we only hear each other and Jeff and <laughs> men and, and sometimes Doug, but the producer is, <laughs> as I'm sure everybody on this call knows, is talking to seven, eight, nine, ten people at once. Uh, you know, he's in charge of everything. So they're, they're the real stars of the show. Uh, take me into a production meeting. I've been in football meetings, I think, but I don't think I've ever been in a, basketball meeting for TV. What, what's, when does that happen? What is it like? How long will it last? Uh, they're pretty uh, casual. They're pretty casual. Uh, and, and again, I think that yeah, tends think to that reflect, tends reflect the, the, the personality, the personality of, the producer. of the producer. So I'm getting some feedback so getting now. Some Are you feedback. guys getting that? Yeah, I hear it. I hear it. Let me take it. So, so, still hear me here? Still getting it. Still getting it. Uh, Jeff, I don't think it's just you. It's not just you, Dan. It's something to open somewhere. Yeah, I can hear somebody yeah, else's opening. Can everybody please everybody mute please their mics? Their mics. Their mics. There we go. So, like I alluded to before, like it, if if everybody's in in time, uh, uh, there'll probably be a dinner the night before, and at some point it'll become a meeting. But it's not like. It's, it's all a meeting. You know, there are lots of laughs and, and just personal lives and, and stuff like that. But Jeff is not a producer who overburdens people with lengthy meetings. So a lot of times it'll be at one of the game day shoot arounds that, that Jay was talking about. If we have an hour between shoot arounds, Jeff will say, hey, let's sit down and talk about the open. We'll talk about it for four or five minutes and whatever else is on our minds. But uh, we don't have formal sit down 60 to 90 minute meetings there. And, and again, maybe it's because we're older and we've been doing this a while, but um, I think what Jay would tell you, his meetings for game day are probably more significant than they are for our games, I would guess. Yeah, the, uh, our, our game day meetings are, are longer than the show, um, which is usually a no-no. Uh, we always say if the, the meeting shouldn't be longer than the show. But the, the, um, I think with the people that we work with, and, and whether it's Eric Mosley or Jeff Dufine, they come in with a plan. And, and the plan is, is comprehensive. So they've got every base covered uh, to mix metaphors, sports metaphors here. Um, and we can add on to that and, and provide uh, maybe something additional to say, hey, th this is something we're really interested in, or this is something we found out here, uh, or let's be prepared for this. Um, and usually Jeff or, or Eric will call me um, before we get to the location and we'll have a brief discussion about, Hey, is there anything, any piece of tape you want, anything we can spotlight, any player, uh, things like that. And so we'll, we'll be prepared for that. It doesn't always mean we're going to use it. And that's one of the sort of like the, the 10% thing. Um, you're prepared for certain things and maybe the game doesn't require it. So, and that's another thing our, I think our, producers and directors are so good at is we're prepared I think for most every eventuality in a game but if it, it they're they're willing to cut it loose if it doesn't fit 
Like just because they put it together doesn't mean they have to use it if it's not going to be good television or if it's not going to enhance the viewing experience for uh, for the spectators at home. And uh, and then the last thing they do, and, and Dan is is the best at this, is they let our people listen. And I, I think that may be the most under valued skill of a, of a broadcast team is the ability to listen to one another uh, so that you can um, you can move off of that you know that that if if we're just waiting to talk uh, it's not going to be a very good broadcast and then our, our our people do such a great job of listening to what may be important to the two of us and then supporting it with graphics or uh, you know, the director cuts to a, a, a shot that that so beautifully uh, backs up what we're we may be talking about. And it, it that, that's a that's a luxury to have people that are that good. We're, we're, we're really lucky. And every time we go to a TV timeout or media timeout, I guess, as they call it, under 16, under 12, under eight, under four, every single time there's communication between me, Jay and Jeff or me, Jay and Eric. Uh, can you find me that? What do you want to do here? Got to get a promo in. Holly's got an interview. Like that's it's 90 seconds of constant communication and collaboration about what we, sh we should do next. And the amount, and Jay does it a lot too. Jay's great at it. The amount of time Jay and I are on talk back during the game, like during play, talking to Jeff or Eric as well uh, about stuff I think is really important because um, it, the more, again, the more ideas that can be shared, the more brains we can put together into this broadcast, uh, the more likely we are to come up with the right idea. Yeah, and the only thing I would differ with is it's not 90 seconds of communication, it's 80, because we have to start every time out by, and this, this happened one time and it's happened every time since. I think I asked Dan, are we missing anything? <laughs> he said, well, if we're missing it, how would we know? <laughs> and so now, now we say that almost every time out. Yeah, it's it's literally an inside joke that nobody but us finds funny, but we have found it funny for about 15 years, so we're going to keep doing it. So. I love it. <laughs> we should do it on the air once. We, we, we yes. Well, I'm surprised you haven't been caught yet by you know, when they say you're clear and the mics are still hot, because that's happened probably to everybody on this screen at some time or another. Yeah. Um, where was I? What was I thinking? On the way. Um, oh, I mean, you guys have brought up Holly, and you guys have worked with, with several great sideline reporters. I, I'm interested to know, as network guys, your, your thoughts on the role of a sideline reporter in, in what you do in basketball specifically. Um, it, it, so in ba I do baseball as well, and there's more time, obviously, in baseball to work in a, a, a field reporter than there is a sideline reporter in basketball. But I, I think a sideline reporter is great. I mean, you know, to get, like, we've had times where, I think this year, Jay, maybe it was at Champions, where, you know, Bill Self and Tom Izzo together live before tip or something like that. You know, Chris Mack live before tip. I love that access. Like, like and, and I'm sure I'm the same as Jay. You know, I just love doing games. I love the excitement leading up to the game, uh, who's going to win strategy and all that. And to hear coaches coming off the floor or live before tip, I think is great. Another uh, invaluable area for us is injuries. There's nothing Jay and I can do about it. So we need a reporter to be able to talk to a trainer or an assistant coach or go back in the tunnel to try to get as close to the locker room as he or she can to get that information. So um, I, again, it's a, it's a team sport and we all have our roles. So, and, and, and I think just like Jay and I were saying where it's not about competing for, I want to say this, you shouldn't say this. I think the best reporters understand some games they'll get in three times, some games they'll get in 12 times. And there, it's hard to plan that in advance. The game is the boss, like Jay was saying about good producers who will just, you know, veer at a moment's notice. The game is the boss and it's our job to, to follow the game, not our job to really direct the broadcast at the expense of where the games go. Yeah, we work with with so many just superstar reporters and and they they each bring a, a different style, but the substance from each that I've worked with has been just phenomenal. You know, one uh, a, a terrific knowledge of the game and then and then context uh, of the participants and to be in huddles and be able to relay information. 
and at times to be able to there, there are times when we've been talking about certain things that they, they uh, whether it's Holly Rowe or Allison Williams, who both are, are spectacular, or Molly McGrath or uh, Chris Budden, you name it, the, the great just pros we've worked with. I think, I think sideline reporting is the hardest job in broadcasting. I really believe that. And, and our, our people make it look easy. And it's been nothing but a joy to work with, uh, with the great pros that Dan and I have been privileged to work with. I've, I've half jokingly said that two of the things you don't ever need are sideline reporters in basketball and TV news people telling you that your power's out. But <laughs> uh, I'd like to love to open it up now for for questions from the throng. If you don't mind either um, typing it in the chat box or raising your hand, I can only see one screen at a time, and we have two up here. So, and don't forget to unmute. Um, just uh, go ahead and let it fly. If you have a question. sure somebody does. Dave, hi, this is Diane. And for you guys who don't know this, Diane Blitz is our chair of our, our NSMA board. Hi, Diane. Hello, and hello, Dan and Jay. Hi, Diane. I'm, I'm so thrilled to listen to you guys today. I had a specific question. Have you ever had to coordinate singing happy birthday to somebody like Dave Gordon? <laughs> <laughs> No, that sounds like an unbelievable chore. <laughs> Way above my pay grade. Yeah. There you go. If I'm not mistaken, it's Dave's birthday today, and I know he'd love it if you guys would, at a minimum, say happy birthday to wow. him. Wow. Do you want? Do you want to see the red match the red? The red and. <laughs> I'd be very happy to do the minimum. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, Dave. Thank so, you. so Dave, you just planned this for today, so you could have. 50 people sing happy birthday to you and uh, it's funny when you when you and i first agreed on the day i wasn't even thinking of the date so <laughs> happy birthday thank you <laughs> we'll consider that our production meeting opening closed there we go <laughs> all right who's got a question for dan or let's see matt where are you matt matt go ahead and uh unmute yourself and ask the question here we go me, me yep. Dave? yeah. Just yep. wondering, how much do you self air check, even after all the years that you've worked together? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I would say I, I do it from time to time. I, I probably won't sit and watch a whole two hour game, uh, but I'll go back and and if I want to hear, you know, if we had like a rules review or an unusual play or a game ending basket, you know, something a little bit out of the ordinary, I'll, I'll want to know how it sounds. I, I think it's good to do. I'm, I'm very self-critical. So sometimes I don't feel better after I've done it. Um, but I, I think it's a very important thing to do. So I wouldn't say it's every game, but I would say once or twice a month, probably I'm, I'm going back and listening to a chunk of the game that I've done. I, I do it pretty regularly to go back and, and review uh, a game that we've done. Um, and especially if I have, I have the time, I'll, I'll watch as much of it as I can. And just to be, you know, completely transparent, most of, most of the stuff that I get sort of aggravated about with myself is, is when I talk too much, you know, that, that most often my, my criticism of my performance is shut the F up for a bit, you know, like the game's going to go on without you analyzing every dribble. And, uh, and so that, that's really the thing I've been working on the most over the years is, and, and, and honestly, that's a little bit of, more of a challenge now because the games have become so compressed. I mean, I think years ago when Dan and I first started, at least uh, you had way more time in a broadcast than you have now. And, uh, and I think there, there's been, uh, at least in my mind, a uh, uh, you know you, you prepare all this stuff, and sometimes you feel an obligation to get certain things in. You know, instead of we do 50 games a year, I'm going to get it in sooner or later. So it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't have to be forced in now. So I I, I tell myself to you know lay out a, a more often more than anything. John Morris, would you like to unmute? I saw your. Uh... I actually saw the little icon there. Nice. Hey, nice. Happy birthday, Dave. Appreciate it. Dan, I got a question for you. You said early on that if somebody came and took your uh, your score sheet away from you at the start of the game, 
you would still be okay doing the broadcast. I think I'd be mortified at that. Uh, <laughs> is there any difference, uh, you coming at it from a TV perspective and me coming at it from mostly a radio perspective with the score sheet? Yeah, I, I would say that's a fair point. So I don't do basketball on radio. I do do baseball, right. some baseball on radio, and that's a different animal. So let, let me qualify what I said. I'd be okay as long as I had a good stats monitor right over here. I like a stats monitor. I, I, from what I understand, there are a lot of play-by-play -play guys who, as the game are going on, you know, if, if a guy gets a bucket, they write down two, four, six, eight, as, you know, and they're keeping track themselves of the number of points they have. Um, a, a good stats guy is very – me. I try not to overburden the broadcast with numbers, but I, I come from a math background, as Jay will tell you. Uh, when we do our graphics rehearsal before the game, I'm very particular about the things that are going to show up on air because I want to know the context makes sense and there aren't any mistakes. And, and it's, like a, it's like a game within our crew to see if they can get one by me. And, and as I get older, they're getting them by me a little bit more often. But um, yeah, I think in radio, it is a different story because, you know, John, you're carrying, you have to provide all that information to your listeners. Um, if, if somebody knocks down a, a bucket, you know, that it's going to pop out of the bug on the bottom of our screen, you know, Kobe White, five for seven, 12 points, three assists. And I know that. So I don't have to say it every single time. Uh, I think radio basketball is one of the great skills that a play-by-play -play person can have. And I don't have it because I've never done it. I, I did it a little bit in my 20s, and I've never done it since. But, yeah, I think if I were doing radio, I'd be mortified too. And, you know, Jay was talking about writing things and not looking down. I think the most I ever look down is when a guy goes to the free throw line for what I know is going to be a two-shot foul, maybe, maybe even if it's one and one, just not an and one. That's a good time for me to look down and see, do I have two or three little nuggets? Because between free throws, I've got 10 seconds to maybe get into that story. Otherwise, the game is so fast that I, I probably don't have much time. That's about the only time I look down at my notes. But uh, yeah, in radio, I, I, I could see being much more dependent on, on what you've got in front of you. Good, appreciate it, thank you. Uh, Bruce Howard, you have a question. Yeah, guys, you are uh, obviously storytellers and you also have to present the game. So um, say you're at uh, a shoot around and both of you are there and you discover at the same time that, oh, I don't know, the, the, the Louisville freshman guard used to paint porcelain cats in his grandmother's basement till he was 15 years old. Do you guys communicate like, you know, hey, I'm going to take the porcelain cat story or you got it or how, how do you work on developing certain stories without getting in the way of the game? I don't, Jay, do you, I don't know that we've ever had that conversation, have we? Yeah, I, th I think when, when there are certain things that most, most of the things by the middle of the season uh, that, that we know, we both know. And, and I think with, with a story that you may have, uh, most of the time Dan's going to handle that uh, if, it's a, if it's a background story about a player. Um, but most of our interactions, I think, on the air – are very conversational. And so it, it's, if we were sitting around at dinner, we wouldn't, you know, we, somebody wouldn't just tell a story uh, to the exclusion of everyone else at dinner. Um, there, there'd be a back and forth on it. I, I think where, where that may come in more often is uh, with a, there are times when that may be the, the best uh, area for the sideline reporter that we have to handle a, a story about a particular player uh, that adds context to something. Because oftentimes, you know, Dan and I are, are, are mired in the game. Uh, mired is probably the wrong word. We're immersed in the game. So what's actually going on on the floor? And, and sometimes that's to the exclusion of maybe a background story because the, basketball is a fast game. And so when you're dealing with the, the product on the floor and what's actually happening, sometimes, you know, we're not, we're not saying, you know, Kobe White, who's got 12 points, five of seven from the field, uh, but also makes porcelain cats, you know, doesn't fit in as well. Maybe that's something that, that Holly or Allison breaks in with or, or a story about how they develop their game. Or if, if, you know, something that, that maybe we find out at shoot around from Roy Williams that, that Kobe White, uh, broke his right hand when he was a kid. That's why his left hand is so good. Um, if he makes a great move, then maybe Holly Rowe comes in with that um, or Dan or something. Uh, so it's, it's a, a lot of it's situational too, I think. 
And Bruce, if it's something strategy related, like if a coach comes over to us to shoot around and Jay says, are you going to double the big guy? Are you going to double, you know, big to big? Are you going to bring one of your guards down? Like I listen, but that obviously I defer to Jay in that area. So the, the, the X's and O's stuff, that's all his to get in. A lot of the other stuff that you're talking about might be me starting the story and then leading Jay into finishing the story or something like that. But uh, I, I don't, it, it just, I think we strive for it to just kind of happen naturally. We both listen and whoever gets it on the air gets it on. Thank you. And, and if you would please uh, identify yourself and, and where, if, well, where you work and what you do. Um, Matt LaPay, University of Wisconsin play-by-play, -play, John Morris, uh, Baylor Bears, and who else did we have? That's it so far, yes? So if you don't mind, because we have people from all over the, uh, the country on today. Jack Benjamin, unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Yeah, hey, Dave, thanks for putting this on. Uh, Dan and Jay, big big fans of both of yours. I actually work as the radio play-by-play -play voice at Nichols State down in uh, Louisiana, currently back home in New York while all this uh, passes over. But, uh, yeah, kind of a two-part one for each of you. Jay, you mentioned how easy Dan is to work with as a play-by-play -play guy, and I'm wondering, as one myself, what can a play-by-play -play guy do to make your life easy? What, what sorts of questions are good to ask an analyst in, in the flow of game action? And then, Dan, to you, uh, college basketball, obviously, some of the environments you're in, I mean, they're closed gyms, there are tons of fans, it gets loud. Handling end-of-game scenarios when you have buzzer beaters and laying out, uh, I'm kind of curious how you have gone about handling that sort of thing as your career has gone on. First, on on play-by-play uh, -play people and maybe what, what's helpful for an analyst, uh, I, you know, I've not really given that a ton of thought. Uh, I think one of the one of the uh, of the many things that Dan does that that makes him the best in the in the business is he, he does an extraordinary job of of listening to what you think is important and he he finds a way to uh, get that out of you you know but to me it, it's not so much a question as it is a setup and if you do have a question what do you think is interesting because if you find it interesting, you know, if we do all this research and, and we're immersed in, in these teams, if we find it interesting, I'm pretty sure the viewers will, or at least most viewers will. And so the, I, I've kind of used that as a guide that, that if, if I've studied this and I find it interesting, um, that then, you know, it kind of passes the smell test. And Dan's really good at, at figuring out, you know, during the course of a game, if I pivot one way, He'll, 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 he'll lead me there. Or if he, he knows going in because he's such a great listener that I, I'm intrigued by this, this facet of the game. Um, he'll find a way to, to set me up so I can spit out what, what I may think is important. And that, that's a, that's not just a skill. That's a, um, that's a, an incredible talent, I believe. Uh, sorry, that was my dog barking, by the way, guys, if you could hear that. So I apologize. So it's a, it's a all hell's breaking loose up here. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you one thing, Jack, though. Sometimes I'll know, you know, just because Jay's talking about something and shoot around that morning and he's really interested in it. And I'll just make a note. I won't even pursue it with him off the air because I want his answer on the air to be spontaneous. I want I don't, I don't want him to know it's coming. I want his answer on the air to be just whatever comes out. Uh, there are some times where I'll say to him, hey, is it okay if I ask you this? Or if I bring up this, can you, can you do this for me? Like something as simple as a promo. If we're doing a promo uh, for, you know, if we're in Maui and we're doing a promo for the games in the Bahamas, we'll see all four games. And I'll say, do you care who I throw to you? Like, can I, can I hit you with Villanova? Can I hit you with West Virginia? And, you know, his, he can do any of them. But we'll try to do different ones. But sometimes I like to take him somewhere – where I know he's comfortable going, but maybe we haven't had the conversation, so he doesn't know I'm taking him there because I like the spontaneity. Um, in terms of end of the game, it's an excellent question. There are two different kinds of situations for me. One is, like, let's say we're doing Duke at Carolina, and Carolina's down eight, and they go on a big run, and they knock down a couple of shots, and Mike Krzyzewski calls a timeout. Every single time, especially when it's a run in a home arena, I'll just go and talk back and say to our producer, I'm out. Like now, again, you can, we were talking about TV versus radio. You can do this in TV. Our director, Doug Holmes, will take a shot of the crowd. They're going nuts. You might see Krzyzewski upset. You might see Roy patting his guys on the back. You might see guys yelling. 
And there's nothing I can say that can make that moment better. All I can do is make it worse. So if there's great natural emotion in the, in the arena, the most likely thing I'm going to say is nothing. Now, at the end of the game, it's a little bit different. You have to say something. But again, I think the picture, when you're in TV, the pictures can be so powerful that I try not to say too much. Um, I will tell you, you know, we're all in the business and we've all been in these situations. So I will tell you, like the craziest game we did this year was the Duke at Carolina game where Trey Jones had the miraculous play at the end of the game and forced overtime. And I've heard that call a bunch and I, I can't get it back, but I don't like it. I, I didn't think I did a good job. I wish I could do it over. You don't plan these things. They kind of happen and sometimes they work out great and sometimes they don't. But I try to say as little as I can to get the information across and then let the pictures tell the story. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, and Bruce Howard, University of Tulsa. I'm sorry, after, I forgot you after, right after you asked your question. Uh, John Crotty, go ahead and unmute and ask. He has a couple questions. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Hey, Dan. Hey, John. John Crotty, I work with uh, the Miami Heat broadcast doing color uh, analyst work. And there's been a huge push in the NBA, and I'm not a, I'm not a huge stat guy. I use stats to try to make points and see trends. Um, but the analytics have become, uh, you know, more and more apparent. And I've been wading into that a lot more these days. How, how deep are you guys going in? Maybe, Jay, from, a, from an analyst perspective, uh, how deep are you getting into analytics? And, and you know, how much, uh, you, know, it, you know, to me, uh, the challenge is being able to explain it to the fans as well, because a lot of these numbers, you know, really don't mean as much to them as well. That's a good question, John. I mean, I think one of the things for me that's been a challenge over the course of my career is, is trying to balance being a, sort of a basketball wonk versus the people who are tuning into the game because they're, they're entertained and interested in the outcome and they're interested in their team. They may not be interested in, in all the little X's and O's and, and every analytic, but if it, if it can, uh, enhance the broadcast for the viewers. I don't hesitate to use it. I look at analytics uh, a lot, but I try not to overburden uh, the broadcast with them uh, unless it, it, it can really amplify a point or something that can, can help the viewer enjoy that particular game. But I, I have a, a little bit of a, uh, a luxury too, is that, you know, I, I can balance my, uh, my game broadcast with, with studio work. So I'm more likely to talk about an analytical point, an analytics point, excuse me, in the studio than I am on a game, unless I feel like it can really enhance uh, some analysis about a player or a team or, or, or a particular game. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I would, I would agree. It's again, I do baseball as well. It's 10 times as big an issue in baseball uh, at, for me as it is in basketball, I, I think one area, you know, this is this will resonate with you, John, but like if we're doing a Virginia game, you know, it's not about points per game, it's points per possession, it's efficiency, it's pace. Those are the things that we talk about pretty comfortably and freely. Uh, but I don't know that we go that much deeper than that. I, I find it's much more of an issue in, ba in baseball, excuse me, um, because like Jay was saying, who are you trying to appeal to? The hardcore fans who are uh, you know, they don't want to hear home runs and RBIs. They want to hear, you know, newer stats and, and metrics and analytics and that, and that sort of thing. But at the same time, like my dad is watching the game too. My dad doesn't care about war and fork and things like that, but he knows if somebody hit their 30th home run, that's a, that's a big one for him. So I think it is a bit of a delicate balancing act uh, in, in, in all sports for all of us. Right. Now. Thanks guys. Quick follow up on that. Um, and just curious from Jay's perspective as an analyst, in a blowout type situation, I always feel like my partner, Eric, who's on the call too, you know, I'm over there like smoking a cigarette while he's, you know, going on and on and on. Because <laughs> <laughs> it just becomes ridiculous to start, you know, being overly, an uh, you know, analytical on a game that's kind of getting out of hand. How do you guys balance that? Do you have you know, certain topics maybe in the can that you can throw out and bring out during the broadcast? How do you manage that situation? That's another great question. I think it, it, you have to just go by feel on it, at least for us. Um, you, you, it's funny, like I've done a couple of NBA games. I don't have a, a tremendous amount of experience, but, but I think in, a, in the NBA games I've done, 
it, it, it's a little more open to being conversational rather than, than dissecting every play. For some reason, the college game, I think the expectation, maybe because it's 48 versus 40 minutes, but the expectation of the college fan is they're going to get, you know, they're going to get analysis of, of, of each play. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's some of the feedback you get uh, if, you, if you pay attention to what, you know, what fans say either you know, at, right after a game or all that. They're like, enough with all the, uh, all the talk. Tell us what's happening. Um, my thing in a blowout is, is that's, a, that's a time for us to, uh, to talk a little bit more um, about other things, bigger picture. Uh, but when the game's really close, you want to stay on the game. When it becomes uh, uh, less interesting, what's exactly happening? Then you can go bigger picture on the teams, bigger picture on the the league, um, or or the national uh, perspective. Um, and, and that's been something that's been really really fun. Uh, you know, blowouts never fun, but but Dan can go in so many different directions, and and that's what's great is. When, when we can widen out our perspective in a blowout, um, it, it's actually a fun conversation. So I, I always go back, if it's interesting to you, um, my sense is it'll be interesting to the, interesting to the viewer. That's always sort of my, my guy. You know, you know, it's a little different in college too, John, uh, and you don't like to see this because you like close games, but when the walk-ins come in, walk-ons come in for the last couple of minutes, that's actually easier because the crowd will be cheering for those guys. Every time they get a touch, they go crazy. Shoot the ball, they go crazy. You know, that's when at the under four timeout, I'm making sure I know how to pronounce all the walk-ons names, and I know if any of them's got a, an interesting background story, that sort of thing. We're, we're lucky we generally have, you know, pretty competitive games. Um, but you can get a little silly, you can get off topic, and, and because we work for ESPN, you know, if we're on the 7 o'clock game, there's a 9 o'clock game coming, now we're supposed to promote the nine o'clock game or the Saturday lineup or whatever else is, you know, coming up that week. So uh, we can get off the game pretty good and, and nobody will, nobody will have an issue. With it. Rob J unmute yourself, please. And ask your question. Okay. All right. Thank you. And happy birthday, Dave. Thank you, um, Rob. Well, first of all, it's, it's an honor for me to be on this call with you, with you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I'm the uh, play by play boys for Jackson state university uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. And we had a, a rare moment that happened in basketball this season where the manager came in and the coach let his manager come in and hit the shot. It, it like a it almost a half court shot and everybody goes crazy. What 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 got me was the my analyst got caught up in it and he just started doing the play by play before it happened. And I'm just going nuts. Like, what are you doing? So I guess I'm asking how often should the analyst talk during a play? It was, this was his first time doing it, so I would just, you know, and I let him know after the game, you don't do that. That's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> um, well, Jay, Jay's already talked about that, and Jay has, in the hundreds of games I've done with Jay, Jay's never done that. Um, I, I love Dick Vitale. Dick has done that. So, it, again, it comes down to who you're working with and knowing their, knowing their style. So uh, I, could, I can understand your analyst getting very excited. I think you need a little room there at the beginning and then, you know, you can do your four or five seconds, kind of tell us what happened and then let him go nuts. But I, I, I think in the moment it, it's the, it's the play by play guys job to do. I, um, you know, I don't know if it sounded great because it was so much raw emotion and, and it just came across as, Hey, look at how crazy these guys are going or not. But um, it, it, to me, even if it, it can start with me and end with the analyst, but I, but I think the play-by-play -play guy at least has to give you the first two or three seconds of that play. What, one of the real uh, issues for me, first of all, like, like I, I don't think there should ever be a time when the analyst uh, gets into any, any area of play-by-play, of -play. Um, you know, sort of as a know-your-role type of situation. But what's, what's kind of interesting, going back to what was discussed a little bit earlier about an end-of-game situation, one of the more difficult things to balance, I think, is you know, it, going back to uh, what Dan was saying about the, the Duke-North Carolina game this year, which is probably our most interesting game. It, at the end of the game, when, when – end of the game in uh, overtime, when you've got the free-throw situation and – 
you know, is Trey Jones going to miss this on purpose? You know, how, how much of that is the play-by-play person setting it up and how much of it is the analyst saying, well, here, here's, what, here's what you can expect? You know, there's always the discussion of, you know, do you miss it, you know, miss a shot up three, all that stuff. Intentionally, do you foul up three? Um, you know, was Trey Jones going to miss it? There were two shooters behind him. Is it going to be a tap out situation? It, I didn't anticipate he was going to throw a bullet right at the rim. Um, but, but it is an issue, that, and I think it has to be uh, part of it's by feel. And then I would always defer to the play by play person in that uh, because those are important setup. Uh, points and then after it happens um, when it was going on Dan's got to be able to call that without me saying oh my god you know you know that's not my role afterwards when it's replayed that's my role like you know if if Dan's talking over a replay I may look at him the same way he'd look at me if I were talking over the end of his uh, his call Uh, and that that goes to my thing of you should never hear my voice on on an end of game call Uh, now afterwards I can I can chime in on hey here's what happened look at this that this is why it happened great but not while it's going on that that stands that stands ball game there man I need to stay out of that thank you so much Joel Godet uh, please unmute and ask your question hi Joel hey Dave uh, happy birthday is to you as well uh, not a day over twenty two. <laughs> um, guys, my name is Joel Godet. I'm the radio voice at Ball State um, in Indiana. Um, Dan, you mentioning working with Dick Vitale just got me thinking from the standpoint of uh, when you work with different analysts, how much does your approach have to change based on the person that you're working with in terms of how you call a game um, and maybe just kind of the mental approach you take into, um, into a game and into work that day? It's yeah, a good question. And Joel and I have been emailing a little bit recently uh, as well about broadcasting. Uh, it does change. It gets back to the analogy I was making before, I think, like, it's a team sport, and I, I guess I'm the point guard. So I start every play with the ball, but then I, you know, I don't hog the ball. I shouldn't hog the ball. I get the ball to Jay. I get the ball to Holly. I get the ball back to Reese in the studio. I get the ball wherever it needs to get. So when you work with a different analyst, I think it's, and this is just me, I think it's the play by play guys, the play by play person's job to uh, try to put the analyst in the best position to succeed. Jay played the game at a very high level and knows a million things about basketball that I don't. I would be foolish if I didn't try to put him in a situation to get that information out over the air. Not that Jay needs help, but whether it's me setting him up or asking a question or, you know, setting the scene, whatever the case may be. Um, And and just like every play-by-play person, every analyst has different strengths and different passions and whatever, whatever the case may be. So if I do... You know, I've worked with Raftery and Elmore and Billis and Vital and Doris Burke and and, Unit, and everybody's different. So I try to be uh, the malleable one, if that's the if that's the proper word in that sentence there. And and, uh, and, and as I tell people, I talk about this with Jeff Dufine, our producer, quite a bit. Again, not to overuse analogies, I'd rather get the assist than make the bucket. And somebody else can make the shot. I, I'd rather get the assist. So. That, that's the way I look at it. Not everybody's the same, and I'm not saying if they have a different point of view, they're wrong, but that, that's just the way that I prefer to look at it. How do you feel about the, the direct question to Jay as well in terms of setting him up, him up, or is it more of one of those, I kind of just want to lead him down a path and, and let him run with it? I think both have their place. I think it's a feel. I, I think if you go, if, if you're 100% of the time with the very obvious direct question, I think it can sound a little bit forced sometimes, but in certain situations, like Jay was saying before, you know, 4.2 seconds on the clock, the team is, is down three with the ball. The only thing that makes sense for me to say to Jay is, would you foul here if you're Carolina? So there it's the direct question. I mean, I can also say, what options does Roy Williams have? But we all know what the two options are here. So sometimes I think it's a direct question. Sometimes I think it's more, uh, you know, a bit of a softer, uh, more vague conversation like Jay can pick up and run with anything I give him, whether I phrase it as a question or not, he's going to go with it. So, uh, and I have complete confidence. Like I've never thought to myself, I wonder if I'm going to buckle Jay's knees here. If I say this to him, I don't have to worry about that with Jay. So um, I I think it depends on the situation and, and sometimes you can make it more of a statement. Sometimes you can make it more of a question. 
And th- there have been times too where 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 Dan has said, like I may say something, and and Dan Dan may feel like it it wasn't maybe it didn't get out what I wanted. He'll say why, you know, kind of simply say why, and uh, and that that helps me sort of amplify it and and state it the right way. Uh, and maybe sometimes he didn't understand what I said. You know, <laughs> well, I'm Canadian, you know. So. Clean, that crap, <laughs> clean that crap up that you just said. Translates. Right. And, and sometimes <laughs> it's the producer just saying in my headset, ask him why. Why did he say that? And, and that might be Jeff or Eric saying, the producers are great. Um, if you work with a really good producer, they kind of put themselves in the role of, I'm just Joe Sixpack sitting on my couch at home watching the game. Um, you know, I don't know everything Jay knows. And the producer is saying the person at home might not know everything that I know. So even though it was clear to me, it might not be clear to a lot of people at home. And the producers are great too, for pushing me sometimes to ask the follow-up question if need be. Thank you. A handful of questions. Uh, Tyler Springs, you're up. Go. Thanks Dave. And congratulations on the biggest quarantine birthday party uh, that I've seen. <laughs> Dan and Jay, thank you guys for doing this. Uh, Dan, I do University of Memphis women's basketball on radio, and one of the things I've been told is my radio call sounds very similar to my television call, and as someone who has done both, even though less so basketball on the radio, I'm curious if you have any um, benchmarks that you hit on the day of a game, if you know it's TV or you know it's radio, to get into the mindset of, okay, I need a, I need a certain set of vocals based on the medium I'm doing. So again, I can speak more in terms of baseball because I do both there. In baseball, you cannot say enough the score, the inning, the outs, the count, the base runners, uh, what the hitter has done in his previous three at-bats. You cannot say it enough. If you say it twice as much as you think you should be saying it, you're still not saying it enough for some people who are driving around in their cars listening to the ball game. So yes, when I do a radio game, I go into it uh, with a much different mindset. uh, analysts don't tend to be able to get in as much in radio as, as they do in TV because the play-by-play guys hog in the mic to, to give all that information that um, that people need to have. I also have been told and, and agree that all things being equal, like my radio home run calls a little bit louder than my or a little bit more up than my TV call is, and I, I, I that's subconscious, but I guess it's because I feel – that's all there is. You can't see it. You can't see the high fiving and the ball go over the wall and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there should, if you do both in basketball, there should be a difference. Like uh, there are so many great radio uh, basketball uh, announcers and, you know, you hear things like right hand dribble crosses the timeline, cross court pass. I never say that. Like I never say those things in TV. I've never said right hand dribble in my life. I don't think. Um, I, I think, and, and my son is getting, is trying to get into this industry and we talk about it a lot because he's doing some radio stuff, paint, just paint a picture. If you go into radio saying, make them feel like they're sitting here at the arena, paint a picture, tell them what I'm seeing, uh, you know, try to make them feel like they're sitting right beside me. Then, then I, I think that's the most important thing a radio guy uh, can do. But you've also got to give all this information. Like every time a, the ball goes through the basket, you've got to tell me the score. Now, you don't have to say, you can say it different ways, up by four, back within two, six zero run. You know, you can say it a lot of different, but you get, you got to do it all the time. So uh, I find when I'm done a radio baseball game, I'm exhausted sometimes. Uh, I don't feel that way after a TV baseball game. Thank you. Jeff Hem, you're our next on mute. Ask your question, please. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dan, my question is mostly for you on a play-by-play standpoint. I do AAA uh, baseball and radio, but then also some TV work with football and, and basketball. Uh, with You mentioned a while ago uh, you have a lot of playback with your director and producer during, during the action, not just coming out of timeouts. Yeah. Can you elaborate on what some of that looks like, what you're, what you're wanting from him or what he wants from you during the game, and then – my other question, hopefully, would just have a short answer. Overall, for your TV basketball work, how much do you call the game uh, off of the monitor? Uh, outside of, you know, guy goes into a corner and you can't see it real well. Are you going off the monitor? Or are you going from that courtside view with literally what's right out in front of you? Thanks. If the ball is live, I'm 100% watching the court. Unless, as you say, we're blocked out by a fan or an official or another player or 
or, or something like that. I will look at the monitor when the whistle blows because that's when the graphics or the replays or that kind of stuff are, are coming up. So um, as, as far as I know, 100% of the time I'm watching the court. I don't like to look down at all. I'm always afraid about what I'm going to miss, even if it means – uh, the monitor sometimes, and, and you've probably, you may have run into this situation, like when we go to Kansas, the cameras are on the opposite side of the court as we are. So if I'm looking left to right on the court, it's going right to left on the monitor. And my little brain has real trouble with that one. So I try to stay away from the monitor of Kansas as much as possible, but I'm looking at the, at the court as much as I can. Uh, in terms of what I'm talking about to the producer, so let's say somebody went down at one end and had a big dunk and now they come back the other way and there's a foul and it's the second foul eight minutes into the game on a really important player. I know that in the truck's mind there, they want to show the dunk, but Jay will tell you this. I'm on talk back saying, you know, that's two on Johnson. That's two on Johnson. And sometimes in that moment, there's a, there's a little bit of a, well, can we do both? What's more important? And it's the producer's job to decide that, but it could be things like that's an important foul or so-and-so has gone back to the scores table to check in. It's just another set of eyes. It's things that people in the truck might not be able to see. Um, and uh, Jay with, uh, and, and justifiably so, will say sometimes I try to produce a little bit of the telecast, which is not really my job description, but it, sometimes if I feel, hey, this is the big story right now. I know, we, I know we're loaded up on that, but this just happened and can we, can we pay this off and then we'll get back to that. And that's where Jeff and I or Eric and I or Jay and I will all collaborate um, when, when things are going on. I, I probably don't talk too much when the ball's in play, but I know if Jay is, is talking, I've got three, four, five seconds, whatever I've got. Uh, and I might say something really quick, like, again, Johnson's at the scorer's table or, or they're in the bonus now or whatever it is. Just, just little things. Just, again, the more brains that are, that are on top of things, the better, we are, the, the better the chance that we'll get it right. Thank you. Eric Reed, please unmute yourself. Good morning. Good morning Afternoon. Dave. Sorry, Dave. Uh, thank you for doing this again for all of us. Um, and uh, to, to Dan and Jay, Great respect for what you guys do. Uh, really appreciate hearing your thoughts, and, you, and it's been very insightful. Uh, I don't want to be repetitive, but my question is a simple question that I don't, I've struggled with the answer myself in terms of, I mostly, I'm TV play-by-play -play for the Heat going on 30, 30, this is our 32nd year with Miami. Um, looking at the court versus looking at the monitor, I'm somebody that most, I'm looking at the court unless I'm screened out too. But I always wonder about that balance of if you're looking at the court, then you're not 100% sure of what is on the monitor. And that balance of making sure you're tuned into the court, but not missing things that the viewer may be seeing that you may be unaware of. You want to go first, Jay? That's a good point uh, that the viewer may be unaware of. If there's something that is on the monitor that the viewer is seeing that you need to amplify or point out, then, you know, I guess you do have to have your head on a swivel between the two, the two views. I've always found it just from my seat, and, and, and I think my, my seat is awfully different from yours. Uh, if I'm looking at the monitor, it's for a specific purpose. I can't tell you how many times over the course of, of a season I'm on the talk back saying, hey, get a shot of the Michigan State bench. Um, two players are arguing or, in a, you know, or something like that. Get a shot of this coach right now where uh, the truck didn't see it, but because my eyes were up on the floor, I saw something that I could say, hey, let's get a shot of this. Or even something as simple as uh, when we're going to break, you, know, you see uh, an interaction between a coach and an official which may be newsworthy. Um, and, and so you're, you're telling, if I'm looking at the monitor all the time, just from my, my standpoint, the, the, the analyst standpoint, um, I could be missing something that, that winds up being important for the game or newsworthy. And so I, I try to keep my eyes up all the time unless there's a specific purpose for me to be on the monitor. But that's just me. I, I think Dan's point before about whatever works for you, um, uh, you should do. And, and I would agree. I, I bet you there are times like if there was a camera on us, my head would probably swivel 
like Jay said, to the monitor more than I'm realizing, but it might just be a quick, is there anything there I need to see back to the court? I, I, I'm on the court. And it's good to see you, Eric, by the way. I haven't seen you in a number of years since I was on the NBA, uh, on the NBA tour, but I, I think I'm on the court almost all the time. Again, I, I don't know if, you know, how many baseball announcers we have here. It's a whole different animal in baseball. So, you know, as an example, I'm calling what we all know is the Bartman game, the Cubs game in the playoffs in 2003. And the ball goes high down the left field line and here comes a Lou and the fans are standing up and, you know, taking into account that the booth is elevated and it's way down the line. I'm probably 350, 400 feet away from that play. Do I watch it live down the line or do I look at my monitor and, and to try to know, did a Lou catch the ball? Did a fan interfere with it? Uh, I find the, those kinds of situations exponentially more terrifying in baseball than they are in basketball. I find everything exponentially more terrifying in baseball than I do in basketball. <laughs> There's so much more that can happen. The ball's so much smaller. It's so much further away. The field of play is bigger. It's just a we and I love it just as much. It's just a weirder sport. Um, so though, though there are times too where while the ball's in the air, I have to decide, do I look at the monitor or at the outfielder or at the umpire or at the foul pole, things like that. And I can't give you a definitive answer what I always do because I don't know that I always do the same thing. But I think in basketball, with the exception of when we're at Duke, I'm on the monitor, I'm, I'm on the court 99.9% .9 of the time. At Duke, for those who don't know, and I think most people probably know, we're up in the crow's nest, we're high elevated. And Jay and I tend to do some of the game kind of leaning up like this and, and leaning over because we have to see over our table down to the court. So uh, everything's a little bit different there. And I think there are times because our angle is different, there are certain things we can see better, certain things we can't see as well. And I would bet you at Duke, our heads are probably on a swivel a little bit more, although I don't really know. Um, but, you know, I've done baseball games from the bleachers too, right? Then it's a whole different animal. You want to talk about being out of your comfort zone. So we have a boss who says, uh, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And, and as much as that's not a strength of mine, sometimes you just have to embrace the chaos. J.D. Byers up next. We'll have one more after J.D. in uh, recognition of everybody's time. So, J.D., go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks for doing this. I do, uh, I do football, radio, and television during that season, uh, baseball, radio, basketball. I'm almost exclusively now television. And my question is, you know, uh, in the opens or right pre-tip, we normally hit two, three basic, relative, but important storylines. And then my question is, as we lead into the game, do you guys on interval know when you're going to go back and kind of update those storylines, recap them as viewers come and go, or they've now become relevant? Or is that something where the truck is also kind of in your ear say, hey, let's go back to the storylines and, and recap them here? Just kind of a conversation starter there. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's a combination. Jeff and Eric are both great that we had an old boss, a former boss named Dan Steer, who would say, repeat your best stuff, bro. He called everybody bro. Repeat your best stuff, bro. And he, and he would say, go back to it. Nobody watches a whole game. You know, one example I can think, Jay, uh, I'll go over to you on this, is, is, the James, is the Memphis, Oregon game. We did the James Wiseman game. It was a big story. Will he play? Will he not? And we went back to it probably three, four times. But I, I would say, JD, it's very collaborative between me, Jay, and the truck. If anybody has a strong feeling about it, they're certainly free to voice it. But Jay, wouldn't you say a lot of that comes from the truck? Because sometimes, like our producer's boss back in Bristol is saying, hey, this is big. You got to get this in again. So I, I think the truck has a lot to do with it. Yeah, I, I think it, there, there are different components the way I view it. One is, is to, to Dan's point about the Oregon-Memphis game that we had uh, last year. The James Wiseman NCAA issue, he, he had gone uh, to court to get a temporary restraining order to be able to play. So that was a news element. And so the, the, the news was leading up to the game in the open, and then throughout the game it was repeated, even though we covered it multiple times. To Dan's point, that there's, a, there's something that our company talks about a lot, which is time spent viewing. And I don't know what the average is in college basketball, where it's 26 minutes is the average viewer. So they're always telling us, all right, we have a new audience, repeat your best stuff, all that stuff. So the news element's going to be repeated over and over again to the point where uh, someone who watches the entire game is going to be on Twitter saying, we get it, we've heard this already. But that's the way the world works, or our business works, so we're repeating that stuff. 
then there's stuff also from my seat where we, we may have a, we may have a plan for the game that, that here's what's important in this game. Uh, and, and then the game doesn't play out the way we thought it would. So we have to pivot and we might, you know, it, it, we used to do these things called star watch where we would, we would, uh, have two players that we would focus on. And heck, if the two players are, have 30 and 28 points, maybe we're going back to that. If they've got four and two, you know, we, we move on and, uh, and go to something different. Um, so it's kind of like what Dan was saying before on, on the game itself that we're going to let the game dictate that. We have a plan going in, our producer has a plan going in, and we have things that we think are important, but we're not, we're not afraid to throw deck chairs off if, uh, if the game goes into another direction. We cover what, what's in front of us, but, but the news elements um, and the bigger picture stuff that go throughout a game, uh, you know, like when we did that Zion Williamson game, he blew his shoe out. Uh, we went back to that over and over again. Right. And, uh, and so that became, we had a plan going into that game. That plan was out the window 30 seconds in and we had to go, we, we had to go where that story was and it was a, a compelling one. Um, so that, that's where hopefully your preparation and, and your work together as a team can take over and you just, you just handle what's in front of you. And, and Hey, we had no more important, uh, thing with that than when we had uh, the ACC tournament, when we go to do, we go to the arena that morning. We're not sure where they got games or not. And everything gets canceled while we're there. And then we turned into news reporters the rest of the day. Um, that, that was quite a, quite a day that we'll never, hopefully never see again. Yeah. Dallas Cole, you have the honor of the last question. And then I know Wes Durham wants to ask a little bit more about that ACC tournament. Dallas, go ahead. Ellis, are you there? I'm here. There you go. Ask your question. Go ahead. Okay. First of all, Dave, happy birthday to you. RG sends her greetings as well. A uh, question for each of Jay and Dan. I do high school radio play-by-play. -play. I work with a lot of different color guys who are just breaking into the business, ex-coaches, ex-players. Jay, my question for you is, at what point do you realize hey, I'm talking too much, I need to cut this back a little bit. And then, Dan, from your side of things, do you look at your analyst and say, hey, chill a little bit, you're, you're, you're saying a little bit too much here? Uh, early on in, in my career, I probably didn't have a, a good uh, gauge on how much I was talking. And I think as I, I – grew in the business a little bit and became more confident and then uh, looked at the bigger picture, I, I was able to, to be a little bit better at that and balance it out. Um, you know, it should be pretty, pretty clear that, that you're talking too much if you're taking away from, from what your colleagues are, are supposed to be doing. And, and if there's not some dead air, like we have some dead air from time to time in games and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's, it's great. Um, I will tell you that that my my rule for myself, uh, not on on the amount I talk, but just on the when. You, if if I have to raise my voice to speak above a crowd, I, I try to I try not to say anything, because if 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 it's the point where people are screaming about something that just happened, nobody's interested in what I have to say, and uh, and so sometimes I get carried away when something happens and I violate that, uh, but. Um, but I try to I try to keep it to a minimum and and make my point as succinctly as I can and get out and let and let Dan take it. Uh, in terms of to answer your question, Dallas, about would I ever turn to an analyst uh, and say that even if I were thinking that I would never do it during a broadcast? Um, you know, at ESPN we always have producers. It's probably more of a producer or even executive producer role where they do. Uh, you know, annual reviews with people or, or, you know, whatever, just talk to them during the course of the season. It might be better off coming from them than from me. And if I were to ever do it, it would only be after we really got to know each other, became good friends and had, a, had, had a couple of beers. And you, I, you know, you say it very gently, but I, I've never, I've never said that to anybody, to be honest with you. Dallas, 
Gotcha, guys. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gorn, should I just finish up here? West Durham. Well, Jay, you touched on this, and there are a lot of us on this call who have been asked this question. I think Eric was actually on the air Wednesday night when uh, when the NBA shut down. A lot of us were at conference tournaments. I've been asked a lot about that Thursday in Greensboro, and I've thought about what we did, and I was with Bob Balvano on the radio side. You guys were going live on TV. What When sports becomes news – and for those of us that were involved that day, have you thought back, what would you have done differently when when it becomes a news item? What should we learn from something like that, given what we normally do? Both you guys. I mean, because you both worked like – well, Jay was there till midnight working on a union deal. Uh, but what was uh, what was it like, and what should we learn from when sports becomes news? That's a great question, Wes. And you, you, you did such an amazing job. And I'm not just saying that. You did such an amazing job that day from, you know, basically eight in the morning uh, throughout the day of, of framing everything with, with not only the competitive side, but the, the history side and then, and then the news side of it. And it was, a, it was a, a, such a, a human element to, to the entire thing. I mean, it was a public health issue that was taking over uh, in, in a way that we had never experienced before. It, it, was, it was unprecedented in the television age, I believe. So for, for me, when I look back on it, uh, the one thing that, that I, I think about um, more than anything was, was I in tune with, with sort of what was happening in the days leading up to it? And I'll tell you this, like there, there were two things that made a major impact on me in covering that. One was a, a really good friend of mine in Charlotte that's a doctor who, who told me uh, probably a week before that, he, he had mentioned to me, you need to stop flying. And, and then he, and I thought it was alarmist when he said that. And then he gave me a bunch of things to read uh, about, about sort of flattening the curve and all the things that, that, that could happen going forward. And it turned out that all of that was, was prescient and right. And if it weren't for that really good friend of mine, uh, I think I would have been playing even more catch up, uh, on everything, but, but also the, the Wednesday, um, I got to Greensboro on, on the Wednesday. I don't remember the exact date, but everything was canceled on Thursday. I, I, so I got there Wednesday. Dan was already there. So he had been to the, the game. He went over to the arena, and then I wound up seeing him in the, in the, just outside the lobby of the hotel. And he said something to me that, that really crystallized it. You know, Dan, Dan has mentioned he's, he's from, he lives in Toronto, Canada, and he, he had said, I don't think the people in the United States are, are, are paying as close attention to how serious this is. And that really stunned me. And I started really thinking about it and thinking about what my doctor friend had been preparing me for. And so I had a different perspective later for the rest of that day, I think. And, and, um, and I, look, we all, we all entered it uh, with a different perspective. And I'm not sure anybody could wrap their head around it fully. But, but in a long form, answer your question, Wes, if I had it to do over again, I, I, I hope that I would have even prepared myself more for the news aspect of it because it was foreseeable that the, the Ivy league canceled their tournament on Monday of that week. And so th th that probably should have been a question that we were asking more forcefully uh, leading up to that. And, uh, and I think we all got there, especially when we were talking about it on your show that morning when we were, I think seemed like we were all in agreement, you and pack and I, that, there's no way that the ACC can play. And then John Swafford came on right after me, I think, and said, well, we're playing. Um, that, that, there were a lot of stunning elements to that day. But, but I think, you know, Wes, you were, you were just fantastic. You, you went back and it just framed it for all of us, I think, so, so well. And I'm so grateful for that. Well, that's kind of you. I appreciate it. Dan, I mean, I, I just think we learned something from events like that too. Yeah, we, we absolutely do. I, I mean, one of them is that, you know, even if we're uh, – prepared as we can be, we're a little bit out of our element. I mean, I'm not a reporter, never mind a news reporter. And it, it's difficult, but you just, it, 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 as Jay said, it's not a sports story anymore. It's a public health story. It's, a, it's, a, it's turned into a global crisis. 
And what Jay was talking about when we met outside the hotel on Wednesday, um, I, I just happened to have a friend who's an infectious disease specialist at a big hospital in Toronto. And he had a few days, not a lot, but a few days before he had said, uh, he was emailing with me and saying, where are you traveling and do you have to go? And, and I, I remember, right, his name is Andrew. I remember writing back to Andrew and saying, are we nearing some kind of a tipping point on this, Andrew? And he said, we're past the tipping point. People just don't know it. Yet. And, and that's, that's the mindset I took down to Greensboro. So when Jay and I were talking, I had just had a couple of days head start on this again, because I've got a friend who was literally a frontline, you know, first responder on this kind of thing. You know, it's funny, I think back now and I'm a little, uh, I don't think I did a good job because my wife gave me masks that she had gotten from somebody at least two road trips, maybe three road trips before. And, you know, Jay, you and I did Carolina at Duke. That was four, only four days before Greensboro. None of us ever, I don't remember any of us ever talking about it. And we did, I think Kansas Baylor was the game before that. Never talked about it. And I'm in, I've, I've got masks with me. And my wife says, will you wear them in the airport? And I said, yes, I will. And I didn't wear them in the airport. And I would call her and she would, she would, she knew I didn't wear them. And I'd said, there are like three people wearing, four people wearing, six people wearing. Um, but it, it, it all, it, it, to those of us who didn't really know what was going on, it was like a sudden, like a tsunami. It was sudden. And, and, and all of a sudden it changed our world. But uh, I don't want to bore people with the details of this, but I've kind of sort of had something like this once before because I was doing a Sunday night baseball game when Osama bin Laden was killed. Wow. And that was another one where they don't teach you how to do this in the play-by-play -play handbook. Like we were in the seventh inning of a game when the story broke. And, and again, I won't bore you with the details. It's somewhere on the internet, I'm sure. But in the one, I'll tell you what helped me a lot. Mike Tirico texted me during that game I'm such a name dropper. Mike Tirico texted me during that game and said, you're at a ballpark with 45,000 people. You're at, you're at the gathering. You're at the largest gathering of Americans anywhere in the world. That is part of the story. Put everything in context. And it was that word context that, that stuck with me. And I think that's what we all have to do. If, if these world news stories ever come our way, uh, whether we're doing a game like Eric was or whether we were supposed to do a game like we were, uh, I think you just got to, it's not about sports anymore. It, it's, you got to put it in context. What are the people at home thinking about? Are they thinking about their kids who are overseas? Are they thinking about their kids who are at college somewhere? Do they think this is overblown? There were a lot of people I talked with in Greensboro, not a lot, a few people I talked with in Greensboro on Wednesday who were, who were, ah, it's, it's, there aren't any cases in this county. It's going to blow over. And by Thursday, our whole world had changed to an extent that none of us could see. I, I think it's just about trying to put things in context as best you can. But this was such a, a, a you know, uncharted water situation. I think we were all kind of just feeling our way through it to the best of our ability. And, and one other thing from my seat, it, it was from the ESPN perspective, it was an amazing team effort that our, um, our producers, our directors, our coordinating producers, I, I, it's, I've seldom seen people pull in the same direction with that sort of selflessness uh, as it did sort of that two-day period when that was all going on from, from the Rudy Gobert news uh, it, to the cancellation and afterwards. Um, our, our people were superstars. Everybody was helping one another, uh, trying to get the best possible information, sharing it, making sure it got out on the air the right way. Um, it, it was, I was, uh, was very proud um, to be a part of that, that crew that day, well, every day, but especially then when, when everything was hitting the fan, that, that people were so, um, so dialed in and, and looking to, to go above and beyond. It was really, really amazing. Well, everybody, I thought, did a really great job. As soon as that uh, can, as soon as we found out it was gone, I took uh, my son Max, who is upstairs on this call, still in bed, and he and I right, left Greensboro and went to buy toilet paper. But thank you, guys, uh, Dan and Jay. Thank you very much, everybody else. Thank you for joining us uh, next Tuesday afternoon at three thirty. Leslie Visser will join us, so we'll be getting better looking um, as as we progress on the Zoom call. So guys, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see you guys in person soon. I hope so. Hope Thanks, so. Dave. Happy birthday. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, guys. Happy birthday, Dave. Appreciate it.